This is Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany. Inspiring and providing real insight to our listeners with every story. Exploring deep stories behind every guest. Please welcome your host, Bo Tiffany. Hey, Jeremy, how you doing today? Thanks for coming on Digital Voices. I'm doing great today. Always a pleasure to come on any podcast. You know, uh, can you start with telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, where you grew up, and maybe how that environment helped to influence your current interests and career paths? Well, I grew up in a small town outside Kingston, New York, and uh, I mean, it didn't really help me grow towards my career or anything particularly because I've changed careers multiple, multiple times over my life. So, I mean, what I wanted to be then and who I am now is a completely different thing. So, and it's, I mean, I never even podcasts were a thing back then, and I never dreamed of being a radio DJ even because I just didn't think it would ever happen. So, I mean, it wasn't really like a thing I saw in my future back then. Right. Well, with getting to that point, you have kind of built these skills over your, you know, upbringing, if you will, and added them to the toolbox that you use today, right? So even though you've had a multitude of careers, each one lean, lends to its own, you know, skill or useful bit that you bring forward, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with that. I worked a lot of different jobs and customer service areas and I learned how to talk to different people and that's a, that's definitely a skill podcasting needs is you have to be able to talk to anybody that you that comes in your show they all have different personalities you got to learn how to manage each personality on its own accord and not disrespect or not make anybody like have boring conversations because of it you need to <laughs> keep you need, right. you need to keep it interesting you need to keep it interesting and learn how to read people's signs that they can that there's a certain topic that really hit them and you got to like go with that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so any particular aspects of your hometown, uh, unique local tales that sparked your curiosity into the paranormal, the eccentric and global oddities? Honestly, no, because I grew up in a small little suburban town and there was, there was no urban legends there. There was no, nobody I know, nobody I grew up with ever said, Oh, my house is haunted. Like it just wasn't a thing. But in elementary school, I started taking this one book out of the library constantly, and it was about Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster and the idea of living dinosaurs still. And like, it it sparked my curiosity, and I stayed somewhat interested in that stuff for, you know, reading Goosebumps and all that stuff for like years. But just after a while, it kind of waned and went away as I got older because, you know, girls aren't interested in Bigfoot unless you're the guy with the Bigfoot. But so i mean it's just it went away and then thanks to television it came back television and podcasts were brought it back because of all the great paranormal shows that are out well okay because of some of the shows out there that are great that are paranormal a lot of them are horrible but because of the good ones and because of podcasts like monsters among us by Derek hayes like that kind of stuff like reignited my paranormal flame and it just when it came time to start a podcast of my own, rather than just be at other people's, I just decided, you know what? You love the paranormal. Let's go learn more about it by talking to people about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have a unique perspective on you. So you deal, you dabble with paranormal. You have a podcast uh, with that, but you also dabble with music. Uh, tell us, how do those converge for you? Well, I mean, that's the great thing. They don't converge often they have at times but not a lot of times they don't converge just because i mean there are two different aspects of life completely it's kind of like almost like paranormal is a thing that's there but not really there because you can't prove it's there and music is the, the opposite side of the spectrum where you know it's there and it's not going anywhere and it's been around since almost the beginning of time i mean i'm sure there's two cavemen banging on rocks with sticks and making noise out of it so i mean it's just it's bound to happen at some point, but I mean, so, and who doesn't love music? Music is right. something we all grew up with, whether from our parents, our grandparents, we all grew up with music of some kind in our life, and it shaped and defined who we became and what music we liked in the end of the day. So, I mean, it's just, I I had a friend I wanted to start a show with, and I was trying to think of what show to start with him, and it was either going to be TV and movies or music, and TV and movies to me, I think it's, there's, there's a lot of both already out there in the podcast world, music and television movie world but 
I felt like music, I could come up with an original idea that no one has done before. I couldn't do that with movies and TV just because it's just all been done. So you played out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. It's hard to find your own angle. Everybody's got their own show or trying to make a mark. Um, so it, it's fun that you can separate the two and kind of explore them differently. You know, it's uh, leads me to a ne- another question, you know, being that you're in the music, what kind of stuff did you grow up liking? What were your uh, original interests? Yeah, well, I'm assuming you mean music wise. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, it's it's actually really weird because, I mean, I my father was a huge, huge classic. My father played in a band when he was in high school and college, so like a lo- a local famous band. No, they never got big or anything, but and so he was always in the classic rock and just rock in general. That type, and even a little bit of jazz here and there. And my mother was always just into like pop. I mean, she liked classic rock too, but she was into like a lot of pop music back in the '90s and whatnot. So. I kind of came in the middle somewhere, and the first music I ever could say I truly loved was disco music. Bee Gees, uh, Gloria Estefan, Donna Summers, like, I just, I, somehow I obtained, I think it was my parents originally, maybe, or they bought it for me, I don't remember, but I had a three CD set, like you see on TV all the time, and it was all like, it was like called like Totally Disc or something like that, like it was before all that now and that's why i call music crap and all that stuff it was just like a three box set like you you still see them advertised on tv like back in the early 2000s even and it's just that became my listen to for a long time was just disco like i love those three cds i would play them out like in the car in the house anywhere i was sc's went with me but eventually i just started getting into like all the rap that was coming up at that point you know eminem um nas bone thugs and harmony I slowly got introduced to metal in high school. My friend gave me an Iron Maiden Grace Hits and a Cradle Fifth Grace Hits CD, and I fell in love with them and got into rock. And then throughout the years, I just explore. Eventually, I ended up working jobs where I had freedom to like just listen to stuff while I was working. So I would just explore music to no end. And if you know, there's a, there's a list on uh, there's a bunch of lists on Wikipedia of like Golden Age hip hop or horrorcore hip-hop or symphonic symphonic rock like i listened to every artist and every cd they did on that playlist unless i thought they were absolutely just dreadful and i couldn't get past like two songs but i usually gave most of them a better chance than that and so i mean that's why i love my show because i get to bring albums and surprise my co-host even who's a music expert i get to surprise him with stuff out of europe that he's already heard or dreamed of it's just like there's so much stuff out there that i we actually had one of our friends say, which we first started the series, like, are you going to run out of CDs eventually? I'm like, never. I have so many, the, I had so many CDs saved in my library on Apple Music, right Apple Music, that it was, and that's not even the full catalog I could bring. That's just a small portion of it. It's just hours and hours of music. Like, you could, there's, no, I have never run out of ideas yet. And I'm nowhere near the head point yet. If I have to, I'll start going to Google and look up stuff I've listened to in years and go back to that. But it just, <laughs> There's too much out there. You can't run out of music. Yeah. And it seems to fit every mood. You know, there's something for every mood that you're feeling and uh, something to bring you out of every mood too sometimes. So, oh, 100%. Uh, yeah, 100%. Do you play as well as listen or are you just more of an appreciator? I followed in my dad's footsteps a little in middle school when I started, or in elementary school when I started like taking drum lessons to be in the school band, playing the drums. And I did that for a good five years. And then when I went to go to high school, it was basically my freshman year was, okay, you're either going to have to give up band or give up lunch. And I'm like, yeah, it's easy. Bye, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not, my, my freshman year in high school, I wasn't trying to freaking have like no break period. Like, the bar could just relax. Like, come on. <laughs> Who wants that? I mean, right. I got, I was always the big guy too. So I, I got sick of being in the freaking marching band having to carry the big bass drum. Like it's hell. Like mm-hmm. walking in end of May, 90 degree weather, carrying the biggest drum they literally make, like on your shoulders, it's just, oh my God. Like it was torture. I, every year I dreaded that freaking day. Fun story. Uh, when I was in fourth grade, I started playing the oboe. That was mm. my first instrument. But I'm a big guy too. So I, I got to a point where, I felt like I was holding on to this little, you know, and uh, not very manly. 
So I, I understand about the whole bass drum thing. <laughs> Not a great instrument to uh, march with either. So, but <laughs> no, I, I mean that's 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 actually complete opposite of the spectrum. Mine was too big to carry. Yours is too small. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank God there's football, you know. So, uh, um, you know, speaking of those early years, any uh, pivotal moments or people that significantly shaped your path towards your career in podcasting and storytelling? No, uh, I mean, kind of. My my br my brother and I had this mainly my brother, but mine too. We we kind of like had this group of friends that every weekend and when i was in high school and even college they'd be at our house and like halo tournaments and whatnot and just movie marathons like that type of stuff guy stuff or just being outside playing during the day whatever and it was just like i always could tell stories in a way that made people made people laugh like always just come up with the funniest impressions and the jokes that would make people like either laugh at me or with me i really didn't care which but <laughs> it was just it was attention who gives a shit right but, so i mean it, it went both ways and just I guess that kind of does help with podcasting in the end because I learned how to talk. And I mean, my dad was a big thing too. He would, he would take me to like, it probably doesn't sound good nowadays, but after, after I would go to work with him all the time at his car dealership slash mechanic shop slash Hertz rent a car. And after work we or at lunch, me and him would go, he'd take me to the bar with him. And like, we, we never could sit at the bar. We'd have to sit on the tables or whatever next to the bar, but I would go hang out with his friends and him at the bar and like, hearing them joke around and like hearing those j jokes. I was way too young to hear at that time, most likely, but as my mom scolded him for multiple times, but <laughs> it's just, I mean, it kind of like, I, I got humor way before a lot of my friends, my own age did. And I learned humor. I shouldn't have learned. And I mean, I, I'm, I, I didn't care, but it just, so, I mean, it gave, it gave me a dirty mind to begin with that young age. And that made my podcasting so much easier. Cause I can come up with just the dirtiest jokes in the world. And, People either die laughing or there's oh I literally get like the oh my god reactions. <laughs> you know you have a unique storytelling that blends facts, fun, and the fantastical, um, which has become a signature of your work. How did the style develop, and what challenges do you encounter with honing it? Well, I mean, I guess kind of all just because. I grew up reading all these fancy books and all like even even being into the paranormal the little bit I was as a kid like you just you learn all these things that are like fancy Harry Potter the inheritance cycle Lord of the Rings I mean all these different fancy worlds and they're always in my head so I just can think of I mean if someone says that's why I love my paranormal show whenever people bring up like they come in they try to school me on like ancient history or something like that and I can compare anything in ancient history to, to a paranormal topic these days and how they relate. Like I can just pull the facts down. And that's also from my schooling too, though, because I loved school and I used to excel at history and excel at all of it. So I could see the links between things that a lot of people just don't take the time to even try to see. It just, there's so much out there. And yes, it's hard to tell in some ancient history if it's fantasy or reality, it's hard. I mean, mythology is technically history, but it's just very story told elaborate history and i mean i mean yeah the first unicorn was really a rhinoceros because marco polo couldn't tell the difference but it's just it's the way it goes was it, I, mean, I thought it was a, uh one of those horn seal or uh like a walrus that had some kind of like spiral horn oh the no no the no no marco polo was anywhere near narwhal i don't think i had just thought that he had gotten it somehow i and if he you know touching into some of the stuff that you know about um you believe in pre-civilization or pre-history you know getting into like go back to tempe and some of these you know ruins that we're finding that we had no idea existed that completely shatter our current paradigm of of recorded history you know and there's a there's definitely a strong uh resistance to you know a, adopting the new facts and the new paradigm, um, especially when you take a look at some of these things like Gobekli Tepe out in Turkey, as well as when you compare it to Egypt. Egypt, boy, the last thing want, they want to do is to disrupt their perfectly crafted timeline. <laughs> you know, it, it's it, it's very difficult for them to shift their way of thinking, um, you know, getting into like the Sphinx and the erosion and you know how that couldn't have happened without 
you know, some kind of water source, which hasn't been around for, you know, about what, 7,000 years, I think, in, on that particular front. Uh, so all of these things are, are things that I'm interested in on my, on my uh, off time. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you talk about um, your podcast now. What got you into this? What interests, you know, obviously you like to watch movies. You're into, you know, some of this reading stuff, uh, you know, like goosebumps and things like that behind the scenes on your fun time. So I'm assuming that this is just a natural natural draw to the paranormal and cryptids and kind of looking at some of these uh, alternative, you know, thoughts uh, and theories that are out there, especially now that we have the internet and and we have more access to data that we've never had before and being able to kind of analyze that, especially with AI tools now, you know, it's becoming an amazing time to live in. Um, so, you know, do you explore a lot of those? Tell us what got you into all this. I know that was long winded, sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Um, I mean, the funny thing is that all this stuff that's on the internet now, finally, I don't have time to actually dive into it like I would when I was a kid. If I was a kid now, I'd be in freaking heaven. I mean, I've met so many kids that are into the paranormal and it's just amazing. Like, my, my own kids aren't because they don't... I mean, they are to a degree, but they're not, like, thr overall involved with it like I would have been. Yeah. Like, my son... My, I mean, my son loves dinosaurs, for God's sakes. So I'm, like, trying to teach him, oh, there are living dinosaurs still. He's like, no, there's not. I'm like, yes, there is. I will sit here for an hour and explain why. But... <laughs> it's just i mean his attention span wouldn't last five seconds of that but uh, it's just yeah there's so much out there nowadays i mean even at, in college like seeing watching in college like sitting in my bedroom like when i'm home watching x files on netflix like like that even that lends to the paranormal so much like if shows like that were trying to like open the doors to the paranormal but they just weren't opening for a long long time and oh, like until Kind of like how Star Trek opened the doors to some of their space exploration and science. Exactly. And, exactly. Yeah, yeah. These larger thoughts seem to come out in some of these great uh, platforms to explore them. And, and for us, it was TV and movies and, you know, and even before that, it was like you said, in books, you know, because we didn't have as much as we do today. Uh, we have a, a sensory overload, especially when it comes to YouTube and and trying to find evidence um getting into the paranormal podcasts that you've done was there anything that really was like wow it blew you away and you're like i'm hooked and this is what i'm doing i would have to say that would definitely be mysteries and monsters in america it's it was a similar to monster quest type show but it went to a lot more rare cryptids too that you don't hear about on a lot of other shows and just the way they told things i mean they almost told things in like uh like they did like the whole retelling thing for each segment and sometimes it was comedic in a way almost the way they did it which is where you get my paranormal views from kind of too like the way i do things in a comedy way <laughs> but it's just i don't know i can that that kind of drew me back into it a lot too because i mean all of a sudden seeing things about different bigfoots around the united states that have been seen given names and seeing all these creatures I mean, even gnomes like the gnome segment is one of the favorite ones of my mind they did just, just the laugh that gnome made was so creepy but so funny at the same time it was just like <laughs> like it was a, like i was like i could have done a better creepier laugh than that like come on like it's just come on it's just uh it got me into it like and, and through the comedy aspect and so it doesn't have to be always terrifying or creepy in a way it could be right. funny like you can make it into interesting i mean how bigfoot erotica exists so i mean you could go so many different ways of paranormal apparently that i wouldn't even think of i was not aware of bigfoot erotica <clears throat> nobody do ever tell. is but it, do, it, do it's, it's on amazon really i came across it because of a podcast i can't think of the name oh wild thing a podcast called wild thing where grover Krantz's niece i believe she is is the host of it and Grover Kranz was a huge Sasquatch researcher in the 70s, 60s, 80s, I think. And basically, like, her whole first season is about Sasquatch. And she, in one of her bonus episodes at the end, she was interviewing a Bigfoot erotica author who has a 12-book series of Bigfoot erotica. And, like, you can actually go to Amazon and look at this woman's work. And 
There are literally reviews that says, oh, my husband and I read this every night to each other in bed. It's so erotic. I'm just like, why did I stumble upon this world and why did I stumble into it? <laughs> I, it I mean, I, I thought it was weird with the Furbies, but yeah, yeah, that's a different level for me. <laughs> and if, I you have, have a foot I, if you have a foot fetish, that's even weirder with a big foot, you know, just that long. Yeah, anyways. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that, that's the ultimate foot fetish right there, but... But I mean, it's just, uh, makes, I don't know, this, the, the paranormal go, can go obviously so many different ways be, and that right there, it proves it. Like it's got, and there's a lot more than that as far as uh, Ronica comes paranormal too, but I ain't going to go into all that because that's just not a world <laughs> I venture into that often, but. Yeah, we need to, to slip down that rabbit hole. <laughs> so all of this uh, culminated into your work on paranormal, the new normal, which is what you're currently working on. Um, why don't you give our listeners some insight to that? Obviously, we've gotten a little bit already, uh, but let's plug that. Well, Paranormal the New Normal, I wanted to do a paranormal interview show where it was all about the guest, not about me trying to just talk the whole time with the guest, barely being able to speak, because there isn't many out there where it's about the guest every episode. It, most of them, it's just one person or two or three people just talking about a topic that night. I mean, and it could be entertaining. Yeah, it can be, but also going to be like, you haven't experienced this. Why are you talking about it so much? Like, go move on to something else for a while. And just like, I get that. I get that. And But I wanted to have, I mean, I'm, I actually do a show like that called Global Strangers as well, but uh, where me and my two co-hosts just literally sit around and drink on Sunday nights talking about different topics. But I wanted to do one of those shows too. And I said, that's an easy way to do it. But the paranormal the normal i want to be about the guests and their experiences and then if we do sit around and talk about different topics at least it's two different people's two different people's opinions on topics and we're not staying on the same one for the whole episode there's no way right. it, i i wouldn't have enough questions for that but it's so i mean it's just and i've been told that it's in my apple reviews you can see it like people love the fact that's about the guests i've had i've had people guests on my show become listeners because they love how the format is so, I mean, I just wanted to do that. I wanted to be able to put people who are have a story to tell, get them out there and let them tell a story without judgment, too, because I I hate that when you're on a show and they're like, and the guy's like, no, it, it wasn't a ghost. It was just dust. And I'm like, how do you know? You weren't there. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's just, I I was trying, to, I, I saw a lot of things I didn't like in podcasts and I corrected those on my show. So I have a podcast that I just did, uh, and the gentleman was in a really old building uh, in the mountains of Italy in Milan, and I swear to God, around minute seven or so, his name was Dinny, D-I-N-D-H, or uh, yeah, so D-I-N-D-H, uh, O'Brien. But around minute seven, something or other, I swear to goodness, because I had to look at it like 20 different times, I, I see some wisp of something and, and it's very, it's, it's very noticeable. So I don't know um, if you're into that kind of stuff, take a look, because I'm trying to figure that one out currently, but I love the paranormal. Uh, I think that, you know, whether it's, why is it hung through history as a, a constant theme and belief? You know, and there's always a, an ounce of something and there's this unknown that we continue to find exists. Skinwalker Ranch, huge into that show. You know, the, um, the idea of, you know, it's history with the Indians and the Ute tribe and the curse makes for a great story. But the um, Skinwalker Ranch series now, you know, has, I know their market is an entertainment company, but, you know, as they promote it, they promote it as 100% real. Um, and I find myself scratching my head thinking, man, what's going on here? Do you follow Skinwalker Ranch? And what are your thoughts on that place? I watched the first two or three seasons. I, since I moved, I don't have cable anymore. And I, I yet to catch up on on streaming. I mean, I always liked it. It kind of annoyed me the first season a lot because who the fuck is just says my name is Dragon. But 
That, that that drives me nuts. That drives me. So what happens nuts. when you have a childhood friend that you t- you just got to bring him along with your success, and and I feel like that's where Brandon put him. I mean, no offense if they ever listen to this. I think they're great people, but there's definitely some loyalties and friendships there that, um, yeah. you know, I, I don't knock that because it's a rare piece and quality to find. It is. I mean, but it's it's a good show, and as far as I think, they're not faking any of the stuff they're finding. I they 100 percent are not faking it because. And I've been trying for a long time to get um I can't remember his name at the moment, but the guy that the guy that funds it all that sits in the chair with the suit and the glasses. Uh, I've been tr- so currently it's Brandon or I don't know yes, if Brandon. That right. Yeah. Brandon, uh, yeah. Before it's Bob Bigelow, I believe. <clears throat> yeah, Bre- yeah, Bob Bigelow owned the farm a long time ago. But Brandon, I I follow him on Twitter and I've been trying to get him in my show now for like a year. But I've yet to get a reply from him. And I got I I keep trying a couple months, like send him a message and be like Hey, I'd love to get you on my show to talk about your show. Like, but it just it hasn't happened yet. I mean, yeah. but I I think everything they're doing is real though, because I mean it is a very hot spot area for paranormal activity and the stories are there in history. So what do you want to like how are you gonna do that? Like you can't fake it. And those UFO shots they got, you can't fake those. I mean, they wouldn't look as good as they do if you faked them. So this new season has really blown my mind and the end of season three um they did some lidar tests that actually came back with images that they couldn't see visually and it looked like a spire and you know so there's there's definitely a lot of anomalies when it comes to like gps and you know some of the um, technology Batteries are always draining, you know, you see uh, orbs and, and other things. And then obviously the UAP or UFO, depending on what term you want to use. Um, but it seems like with season four, they're showing proof of what seems to be a vortex anomaly. Yeah. That's centered around the triangle on the ranch and uh the really interesting part that I think is, uh, I can't wait till the next episode comes out. They started drilling into the Mesa and they, last year, like they hit something that they couldn't penetrate and they have a drill that can go through like uh, steel reinforced concrete, you know, and they're still not able to dent it. And, mm-hmm. you know, so they found this anomaly within the Mesa that's about as tall as the Mesa. Um, and it has some, interesting properties that seem to affect like gra- or the the compass readings as well as gps readings um and probably uh, you know could have something to do with the draining of, of these batteries or siphoning of energy super interesting um but they got me hooked so whether it's the way yeah, they tell I, it or it's the facts of it man i'm, I'm one of their number one fans <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I have to catch up on. It. I really do, and I it's it's on the list. It's on the list. It's a long freaking list. I always, I always compare this, the list of things I have to watch, whether it be TV or movies, to when the ancient Romans used to let one of those scrolls run loose when they opened it. Like that's kind of what my freaking list is like. But and I'm also <laughs> happy. I'm I'm also extremely happy that uh, HBO Max and Discovery became one streaming service now because I had to cancel Discovery Plus for financial reasons a long time ago, and. I missed all the shows that were on there that I freaking loved watching that has all the paranormal aspect to it. So yeah. I can definitely get back into that now and have more content to add into my podcast because I've seen things. So let's move to the startling phase of your podcast career. Uh, how did you initially balance your work of paranormal, the new norm with your quote and listening duties of man- manacle music musings and global strangeness podcasts i mean that's that's a plateful <laughs> well at one point at one point i actually was on six podcasts holy cow but yeah um that got a little crazy but i mean maniacal music musings we do same as i mean we do specials on both my shows but on maniacal music musings we usually do specials twice a month and it's a weekend two week basically two weekend days throughout the month and then other than that, it's just our usual our episode every Tuesday night at nine PM Eastern. Usually, we vary from that occasionally, but usually that's when we do it, and it's pretty easy because it's just that one show a week, and then I just editing it doesn't take that that much time. I just 
throw it together within like a half hour. And then from there, that's, I mean, paranormal to normal, that takes more time. That's, that could be me doing five to six to 10 interviews during, during the week. Cause I'm always months ahead recorded. Like that's just the way it goes. Like I, I like being prepared and having stuff in case something happens to me and I can't do it for a while. So I just, I mean, the way, I mean, that's basically the best way to balance it is paranormal to normal is the show that takes up most time. Every other show I do is once a week and that's it. And right now I'm technically on four shows because I rejoined the original show I started on that I helped create what well, I helped uh, create and start Bracket Bastards. So I'm back on talking? that now. What are you doing on that one? It's a bracket show or tournament show. It's kind of like the specials I do on my shows, but it's just a it's a bracket or tournament and each each episode say different bracket whether some movie theme or some TV like today we just finished up our three part 80 movies 80s movies brackets and it was a lot of work with those ones um but I mean we got like TV dads coming up next week so for for Father's Day so I mean it's just it's a fun show and it's just very comedic like it's just pure comedy and it's just fun it's just like it's like it's, it's what you've done all your life arguing with your friends over about which movie's better Star Wars or Star Trek or I mean, whatever your whatever your argument was, Batman versus Batman. So you're lucky to have a lot of friends with similar interests, and you're able to collaborate together. Uh, is that something that you developed before you started doing the podcast, which is why you started doing the podcast, or is this developed through doing the podcast? It's developed through before I did the podcast. Since I'm been an adult, really, I maybe have had one good friend here or there that's not technically family, and. I mean, that's just adulthood. You don't have like a bunch of friends unless, I mean, some, unless you're white, unless you marry a woman who has a lot of friends and then you become friends with them. But other than that, you just don't have a lot of friends usually. Like it's not like a huge group that you're hanging out with like you're in high school or college anymore. So podcasting, I have a huge, I have dozens of friends I met in podcasting that I never would have known. And I talk to them most, I talk to a lot of them on like a daily basis. Like I'm, I'm in four or five different. Um, and I would assume that that kind of, stirs those creative juices as well and uh you know it's birds of a feather flock together you know for our listeners um i always find you know if you want to be like someone hang out with people that are like that you know and uh if yeah. your friends are all drinking and smoking and not really going anywhere chances are you might not either <laughs> it's all about your circles i think so very true i yeah. mean well I mean, I've I've hung out I've hung out with both groups, and I'll hang out with one I'll hang out with them both the same day. I mean, just at the end of the day, you have to take personal responsibility for yourself too, and not do everything your friends do. I mean, yeah. the old adage: if they jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge too? Like, absolutely. Well, and then you can be a leader and set examples. You know, Hopefully exactly. We'll see. You know, uh, let's see. As you navigated your career in podcasting, you managed to present controversial topics in paranormal the new view and while maintaining an engaging and respectful conversation um, and how did you do that some things are kind of touchy yeah i mean if someone i've had i've had guests for who bring up like they have a history of abuse of some kind when they were a kid and or or i mean just people who have been abducted by aliens and i've talked to a couple of them they have some mental issues left behind from it like some trust issues and some other it makes you question your mental stability every day i'm pretty sure i mean i haven't had it happen so i can't 100 guarantee that but i mean it's just you would look at all these people i mean look at barney and betty hill one of the first real abduction cases that came public and they were never the same after it like they didn't barney didn't live long after it because of it because he was so just distraught over it it's just it changes your worldview completely and that's just if that when that happens your mind kind of snaps a little bit and you need to put it back together slowly or you're yeah. gonna build it wrong yeah is there like a support group for you know people of adoption or people that have there, witnessed cryptids and things like that obviously the first thing uh, is either you keep it to yourself or you know it blows your mind and it creates some kind of long-term issue like benny and barney right great example you said you didn't live long after that i think there's some realities that you witness that you know it's almost like ptsd and war you know like someone's gonna exactly walk you through it um 
anything like that currently or i mean i i know i've heard of alien abduction support groups i know they exist if, I, if, if you want me to remember the name of it i'm yeah no but i don't remember the name of it at all but i mean as far as like people who have seen cryptids there really was no support group for that like i mean there's now there is though with facebook and with twitter there's there are groups in Facebook where people who, who where you can go and tell your story, and you're gonna he hear from other people who tell you who to, to tell you stories about meeting the same cryptid. And the internet's a great place for that. I mean, yeah, there's always gonna be trolls out there that are gonna try to hate on everything you say, like because they don't think it's true. And uh, well, then why are you in this group? Yeah. Like, and they usually get they usually get kicked eventually. But it's just, I mean, I'm I, I'm an admin in one or two of those on Facebook just because it also gives me content for the show a little bit, but and gives me guests. But it's just I. There's support out there. It's just now it's everybody. It's a social thing. It's almost like a social experiment in a way. Well, I think it's becoming more accepted, and I guess that's where I was going with that too. Um, you know, it's uh, with the release of the Pentagon information. You know, with the UAPs and our idea in terms of not just a few, but an overwhelming, you know, group of us are believing this is a reality that we live in you know um, you know and that gives me one thought that i wanted to ask about especially with someone like you you know uh, i can't remember who said it but um there was someone that said i think he was like a military general or something like that that said you know just wait the next big you know riff is going to be uh this ufo stuff you know uh, it, as a way of, to manipulate the population with these huge radical stories. Look at this hand while this hand's doing this. And so, yeah. you know, I always had that in the back of my head is this, is this, uh, you know, being a, a, a pile of crap being fed to us or, you know, is this reality? Um, I do like chat DPT in the terms of exploring topics because you can really, you know, work with it and not just like the free version, but like the paid good version <laughs> can come up with some pretty amazing facts and such to support or disprove what you're saying in a non-biased way. Uh, so I use that a lot and I've been trying to explore this and, you know, there, I haven't been able to flesh out, you know, if it's true or not, even on an AI standpoint, you know, what do you think the biggest proof that really cemented your belief in you know the paranormal cryptids and all of that stuff has come from has it been from interviewing the guest has there been personal experiences involved you know we talked about mental health and such as well you know one of those things that i always wonder is well how mentally stable is this person and without having that contact you never know and oftentimes after they've had this experience, like you said, it's traumatized them. So you can kind of tell they're a little off and you always wonder which one came first, the chicken or the egg. So that, you yeah. know, where are you at with all this stuff? Well, I mean, if you want to ask me what came first, the chicken or the, or the egg, I'm sorry. I don't know. I mean, what came first, the alien or the human? Mm -hmm. The answer is pretty much the alien. The alien came first because there are so many theories about different alien species that settled earth before we were even either a evolved b created or c enslaved take your pick because mm -hmm. i mean just uh the palladians the ceruleans there's so many like different species that are supposed to be ha took over earth the reptilians i mean everybody knows about that one they they all supposed to be took over earth and were war fighting each other on earth before humans came around and whatever whatever story you believe we came from there are so many different theories about how humans are existing even but it's just i mean to believe we are the only people in the universe the only intelligent beings in the universe is just doesn't make it wouldn't make sense to me like it it can't be it can't be mm -hmm. i mean even if you're a creationist and you believe that yes we were created by a big white guy with a beard that supposedly that um we if you believe that even what do you think angels are because there are a lot of people that cross that road where angels are extraterrestrials and demons are too like it's just it, no matter what you believe there's theories out there that prove that aliens are in that theory somehow i mean the <laughs> the bible 
says it. Ancient mythology stories say things that reference aliens. Cavemen drew UFOs on the cave walls next to the cows and everything else they saw. So, I mean, all this proof of things existing that we can't explain. And I've seen things in the skies that I can't explain. I don't usually, I talk about much once in a while, but it's never like a long story because it's not, it was a short thing and it was gone. Like, I saw it for a second, I went in the house. Like, it's just nothing I could do about it. If I could get a camera out, I'm not going to get a picture of anything because it's so far away, but it's not like they were like floating above my head with a tractor beam trying to pull me up. But that, that would be better than I would have. Then I would have a story, but it's just, <laughs> and I mean, it's the same with when people try to say there's no life after death. I'm sorry. Um, one, did you die? So how would you know this? And two, I live in a freaking haunted house. You're going to tell me there's no life after death? Because I can tell you there's some life in my house that's not alive. <laughs> and it's just like, it's proven. It's proven. I caught it on camera. I've had investigators come in and prove it. It's just, it's proven. I mean, even Einstein, one of the smartest men ever, said ghosts have to exist because our energy doesn't just disappear when we die. Yeah, You can't destroy energy. So it's just, I mean, all this stuff, there's just so much proof of. And then, I mean, you want to even get to the far-fetched left, the left side, as we call it, of uh, cryptozoology. Bigfoot, dogmen, take your pick, any of them. Well, those two especially. There's so many sightings of Bigfoot. There's so many sightings of dogmen in this United States alone. Don't forget the world. This is the United States alone. If 75% of these things are not real, if 75% of the sightings are made up somehow by drunk people or whatever, that's still a lot of sightings that, of something that can't be explained or scientifically explained at least. So, I mean... Well, you know, to jump off the, the pier, so let's say, you know, our listeners are believers, you know, and let's dive into this. You know, the things that really made me want to believe and and have jumped off the pier slightly uh <laughs> i'm still trying to hang on but you know it's things like um the pentagon releases and you know hearing from the eyewitnesses themselves you know the pilots and you know now we're able to uh, with the internet you know look at other people's news and such and i remember you know back over 10 years ago, I think it was in the early 2000s, uh, Chile had documented a UAP, you know, exhausting some kind of vapor in, you know, on their uh, infrared cameras, you know, and and then took off at an accelerated rate that they they couldn't explain. Uh, No other visible means of propulsion. And, you know, we hear about, these vehicles now with you know like captain fravor and such that um you know they're able to not only navigate the skies but also the oceans and you know knowing that 75 percent of the world is covered in water you know I, I can imagine that it would be relatively easy you know depending for uh, especially an advanced civilization to set up shop somewhere that we couldn't even see um you know i don't like jumping off the deep end but it sounds like they've been around for a while so you know what do you think their purpose here is un freaking known really i mean there's a lot of theories there's of course the destroy us all theory and there's also the they're taking save a long us all time theory. to do that though <laughs> i would have i would have thought as a advanced civilization they just craft some kind of virus that targets humans and you know there we go Oh, you mean COVID? But um, uh, basically, <laughs> but I mean, the way I mean, there's there's those out here. That's why it's taken so long, from what I've been told, by people who can communicate with their spirit guides, who a lot of times people consider them to be extraterrestrials. I've talked to star seeds, who are those who have spirits that are from space in their body, actually, supposedly, and it's always because it's because since Earth's been founded or created, wherever you want to believe that there's been a war going on between different alien species for Earth. And the war is not happening on Earth. It's happening in space somewhere. And the ones on Earth are just kind of here waiting to hear from them. Kind of like if we're stationed somewhere, if our if the U.S. Army is stationed somewhere, they don't just go out and do what they, got, what they want to do. They have to wait for orders. Good soldiers and all of that. Right. So you think all of this is an intergalactic war for 
our solar system and resources. Or I mean, trying to find a new habitable planet, and they're trying to terraform this one. Or, I mean, I've seen some evidence pointing in that direction as well. You know, it, it's. I mean, I find that hard to. That I mean, the idea. I mean, the whole they're there. You want our solar system for resources thing. It's too science fiction trope. To, like, I mean, does that mean? Because does that mean it's not real? No, not at all. It could definitely be a real reason, but. To me, it's more along the lines of, I, I don't know. I mean, well, then again, you got to go back and think, why are they coming here in the first place? Are we their slaves and we're just being, we're watching over the planet for them until they come back? Or are they, have they been here all along controlling things and they're just basically. Well, we've seen I call in mind a ton of stuff, at least, I guess, on surface level, you know, I mean, you take a look mm -hmm. at our depleted resources for, you know, X, Y, and Z, and, and you know, so it's not like we have a, a plethora of unmined resources that they might find interesting unless they tunnel deep into the earth kind of thing. I, I don't know. I, just, I mean, but also, the other thing, I mean, I hate to use it as the example, but South Park kind of did perfectly with the Earth is a reality show. They took all these different colored people from different planets, all these different animal species from different planets, and put them on one planet as like a TV show almost. Like, what if that's really what it is? What if we're just this? What if what if we're in a matrix of like that making, like or a matrix of any making? I mean, there's just so many so theories that, for why we're here. That was where I was going to go next too. Is that you know, there's simulation theory and there's all this stuff now that. Does that contradict with, you know, the whole, you know, UAP, UFO? Because if we're stuck in a simulation, you know, then does that matter? I mean, how real would that be if it's all simulated? Well, we don't know we're simulated, at least most of us, and that's the issue. And what's better than, oh, look up here. What's going through the sky above you? Well, you're not going to see us right here fixing this. Okay, bye. Like, it's just... Sleight of hand. That's all it is at the end of the day is a sleight of hand just to look over here while we do this. Like, I mean, I I hear, I've heard a lot of stories about glitches in the Matrix type of stories, and it's just, they seem too strange. I mean, some of them are just like, okay, yeah, you, you're probably just stoned or high or drunk, but whatever. But, I mean, a lot of them seem like, okay, this person is like a grandma or grandpa. Like, I trust them not to be out there, like, not straight minded at that point. Like they're going to be straight minded and they're going to be like, what am I seeing? Right. You know, let me ask you this. Um, you've interviewed a ton of people. You have researched a ton. You know, you're well educated. What do you believe? If you're die, if, if you're to die tomorrow, God forbid, you're choking on your can there and, you know, somehow you, you pass away. What is the culmination of what you learned? What are what's your belief system as we speak right now today? I mean, when we die, I 100% believe that we basically go to a DMV wing room in the sky, basically, where our spirits, our souls, whatever you want to call them, our essence, just goes up there and it waits in this place, whether it's another dimension or whether it's a another planet or whether it's just space you're just sitting in space for some reason and then you're basically waiting to be put down another body i believe that there's kind of an extraterrestrial reincarnation going on after we die i think i for that's why i've heard the most evidence of and if people can you, if people can you dive into that just give me a little bit more uh example yeah. before you're saying that i mean well because well first things first you gotta look at reincarnation there are so many stories in this planet of reincarnation or of children with past life memories that cannot be unex they can't be explained. How does a four year old boy have nightmares about dying in a plane crash in World War II? Right. Like how? And have the details down to everything down so sharp and there's stories like that all over the world. But it's just I don't know. I mean with that and then with I feel like remote viewing also holds a hand to that. What was that? I, I didn't get. I said I think that that remote viewing also holds a hand to that. You know, maybe that that's exactly. Thing. I mean, yeah. I mean, I've had I've had a guest on who wrote a book about lucid dreaming, and I forget the other 
thing he said, but uh but yeah, lucid dreaming and oh astral projecting, yeah, lucid dreaming and astral projecting. I mean that right there. You can go in lucid dreaming to different dimensions by traveling with your spirit out of your body. So if our spirit comes out of our body that easy to do that, if we're properly trained on how to do it, then what are we gonna do when when we pass away and our spirits will just go to wherever they need to go? I mean, could it be another dimension? Possibly, but it could also just be anything in space. I mean, that's the problem. We don't know what exists really. Do you think I that mean, the spirit is cognitive or do you think it's not cognitive? Like you and I are self aware right now, right? You know? Yeah. Um, are you still self aware on a spiritual paranormal ghost level? I always feel like if they are, there's, you know, because you, you get different types, right? You get pair or poltergeists, and then you get ones that seem like they're stuck in a loop where, like, you know, you'll hear footsteps or whatnot through a house, even though no one's there. Um, and so it just seems to be a, like a repetitive energy that comes through. Some of them seem malevolent, and some of them seem, you know, empathetic, depending on which ghost show you, were, you watch. Oh, trust me. I had, I had I, the spirit that's in my, that's in my garage was killing chickens so it, i definitely understand the malevolent ones but at the end of the day it's just the fact that i mean i think they stay cognitive i think they stay they knowing until they get off earth once once they're out of earth once they move on to the back to the waiting room basically as i call it then i think you're just basically uh following orders once you're there i think to be fully cognitive you need to be they need to have the brain, the hardware to be fully cognitive. And then once they're put into a new body, if it's if it's a baby body, then then I think they lose a lot of it too in the transition. That's why. But then again, they say that babies can and young kids can kind of cross over a little bit because they're still new to the body. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, nowadays, especially you don't have parents shutting it down like they used to in the 90s and 80s and 70s and older even. They used to shut down if their kid said, oh, I saw, I talked to this thing that's not there. Like, I talked to this figure. Like, they would shut it down because they're like, don't talk like that. Everybody's going to think you're weird. Nowadays, they embrace it. A lot of people, well, some parents do, not all parents, but a lot of parents do nowadays. And so a lot of us are staying connected to the other side a little bit longer than we used to. So who knows what we can discover in the future with that. What do you think academics will start treating this more as a, rather than a pseudoscience, like an actual reality, you know, and start exploring this more. I think we have, you know, with like government contracts and some of these programs, but I feel like there's not been the asserted private sector or, you know, in the schools of thought to really explore it. They're so, they're, they're very quick to dismiss um, and try to explain it off in other ways rather than accepting. So I feel like, you know, we've talked about a few of the, um, the pseudos that are out there that, you know, a lot of us think need to gain acceptance, but in mainstream still have it. Um, you know, are there any realities or facts that we can say, look, you know, and, and they can't dispute? I mean, I think science is already taking it very seriously. They have, I mean, the public science, the government scientists have been taking it seriously for a hundred years mm. um, or longer even really if you think uh if you think about it but it's definitely gonna take it more seriously now because i mean they have zoology college courses and everything you could take i mean not zoology um cryptozoology to classes you could take I, it was a major at one college i looked out when i was looking for colleges in high school i looked for a cryptozoology major in one college and i found it in one college up in maine i think but or I found like an online one a few years ago. I was actually considering doing, but I'm like, I'm not wasting my money on something I don't know is real. Even they could send you a piece of paper or or put you through some fake like courses they made up, like just to get the money out of you. Like who knows? I'm on the wrong but, side of forty, and we had nothing like that when I went to college. So, I, oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, but um, you know, I'm glad that it's becoming more open and and talked about. I, I mean, I've also I've also talked to astrophysicists <clears throat> and. uh astronomers astronomers i should say and um i've also talked to biologists about it, though and 
they all have interest in it. Like they all, they, they get bored with the stuff that they, everybody knows is real. And that's been studied a thousand times. They want to look and try to discover their next big thing. And look at, look at biology. The gorilla was encrypted until it was proven to be real. Right. The giants, the giant squid was a cryptid. It was still proven to be real. And they just found, they found a shark that has been alive for 400 years that didn't, they didn't know existed. I mean, Stuff like that, which I mean, the, the megalodon is definitely real, then, in my opinion. But well, that's coming soon, I think. <laughs> there was a movie about that. There was some kind of thermal leader he was stuck underneath and finally escaped. That's that, that was the Meg. That is an amazing movie. But it was. I, I um, enjoyed that. <laughs> there, there, there actually are a lot of movies out there about megalodons. It's a very. It's highly believed by a lot of people in the marine biology fields that megalodons could very possibly exist still. There are things. There are things that have come out of the ocean dead with bites in them that can't be explained. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you say that. I saw Blue Mako that uh, was, I think it was a YouTube video, and I mean the whole thing. It was a giant Mako at that uh, Blue Mako shark, and it was chomped in like half by something mm. much larger. You know, and this this is like fourteen yeah. foot shark. Um, it's a. Uh, it, it, three quarters of our world's, you know, mostly unexplored yet. So, you know, I believe there's anything possible. Oh, God, yeah. You know, um, let me just take a look. I kind of got off track. Normally, um, you know, I kind of dive in and, and all this, but you're talking about, um, you know, how there's a lot of local cryptids, you know, that people don't even know about early in our podcast. And here in Wisconsin, where I'm from, we have a few. Um, Ooh, one Wisconsin. down by. Yeah, so you probably <laughs> you're familiar. Um, what do you know about that? I, I'll, uh, I'll well, I mean, in Wisconsin, I believe you have the land between the lakes. Do you not? Mm -hmm. Which that right there is one of my favorite things ever. The beast of the land between the lakes, the famous dogman haunt, and. I actually talked to D.A. Roberts, who was part of the NADP, North American Dogmen Patrol or I forget, project. Oh, project, yeah, North American Dogmen Project. And he's been the land between the lakes, and he said that place is the creepiest place to be once you get past the first half of the island. And yeah. that if, if something exists, it lives in the second half of the island because there's nothing there. There's no roadkill. There's nothing. You're It's like a dead man's land, basically, or you will be a dead man if you go there type of land. So I mean, some, I love it. got some good yeah. history, especially for uh, everything from serial killers to you know mm -hmm. dogmen to I think was it the Briar Bush or Briar uh, Briar Road? Oh, oh yeah, the Beast of Briar Road as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one. I was yeah, the, the the Beast of Bri another another dog, another famous dogman case in a different part of Wisconsin altogether. That's the great thing. I mean. But up there in the in the north of the United States, that's big dogman territory, like central yeah. north, like oh, that's huge dogman territory. I mean, technically, dogmen are in every. I've been seen in every state except Hawaii, but well, ironically, which, uh, Bigfoot's been sighted in every state too. You know, which means except Hawaii, right? Which is funny that you say that because I was thinking, um, you know, obviously, if if every place had a story then that would be you know more apt to give credence to you know mass hysteria or whatnot because i couldn't really see hawaii you know being as far away as it is um but you can almost start to develop a migrational map with the sightings because i feel like these pockets of bigfoot or gorillas or whatever they might be um you know, aren't just usually located in one spot. And in fact, when the Bigfoot hunters go out, they're watching like a, a migratory pattern. You know, they might be in a certain area for a while, but then they up and, and go and they can travel quite a distance in a relatively short period of time. What are your thoughts yeah, and on migration? From what I've been told and from what I kind of can believe, well, I mean, I mean, I guess I could believe pretty much any, almost a lot of theories on Bigfoot, but as far as that goes, but what I most believe is they have territory. I mean, it's been proven they have territory they're protective of, and I think when a young foot is born, 
and they the parents stayed with the parents for a while until like, like any species well like most species and once it's old enough it's made to go find its own territory and that's where the migratory ones come in is the young ones are trying to find their own territory and a mate possibly but there definitely are areas where there's these clans of bigfoot that stay there for hundreds of years over time because they're always seen in those areas i mean the olympic project or in washington i mean the government that's a government setup and it's small town monsters went there to film their doc, one of their one of their movies and there's seriously is it just like a row of bigfoot nests on the ground of big nests that are too big for any other animal and are considered to be bigfoot nest like the government knows sasquatch exists they've saved it before from forest fires and whatnot like they know they're just i I'm, I'm one of my famous things on my show for saying is wait until the next pandemic it'll be bigfoot not ufos <laughs> like when we need another distraction that's gonna be the next thing they come out with is that oh bigfoot's real we've known about it for hundreds of years ben franklin knew about Bigfoot for god's sake so you know it's funny i, I talk about those um spin tactics and manipulations uh and like you said you know it's these big things that they can pop out and say oh look at this hand well the other hand's doing x y and z Sp- you know, wrap- hand, gotta love it yeah, to wrap this up, you know, let's look towards the future for you. What can listeners expect from your upcoming projects? And what are a few new topics or fields that you're going to be diving into in your future? Well, uh, on Paranormal Do Normal, we have a lot of great interviews coming up over the next month. Um, off the top of my head, I can't really even think. I mean, more mediums, of course, always going to be mediums because I that's one thing that my show has made me as a believer in mediums and psychics. So you have more of them coming up. And we also are starting to do one-on-one brackets on both of my shows because we're taking the specials that we usually do each month. And we're I'm offering them up as one-on-ones, two-on-ones, however you want to do it, uh, three-on-ones. Just for anybody who wants to do it, whether they be a listener to the show or if they're another podcaster, they're always more than welcome, welcome, come, welcome to come do a bracket. We, It's fun. All right, I recorded the first one about it half a month ago now and this month i got a few coming up on paranormal new normal same with maniacal music musings and for maniacal music musings we have uh we have a dog dog fashion disco bracket that probably will be releasing right around the time this episode comes out i'm guessing i'm not sure though and we also have chancy's surprise birthday bracket coming up in about three weeks from when this was recorded i don't know when it's a release but it'll be around then probably maybe and there's always every month there's always two brackets on maniacal. So it's always a fun thing. We got some more one-on-one brackets coming up on that one as well. And then every Saturday at two o'clock Eastern, one o'clock Central, please check out Bracket Bastards. We're on YouTube. Just look up Bracket Bastards, you'll find us. And we're live on YouTube every Saturday. And Global Strangers is live every Sunday night at nine o'clock PM Eastern. And and you can find us on YouTube. You can find us on, I think, Twitch. I, and you can find us on Facebook because I always copy it to my Facebook as well. So, well, you know, I'd be interested in hitting one of those brackets if you want to have a another podcast host on sometime. I think that'd be fun. I'll, 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 I'll shoot you the list. Sounds great. Well, hey, I appreciate your time, Jeremy. I wish you a great day and uh, I look forward to your future episodes. Keep creating. I think it's, uh, it's definitely engaging and um, explore some topics that I'm definitely a fan of. So thanks again for your time. No, no problem, man. I'm glad to have a fun conversation. Likewise. All right, buddy. I appreciate you. Um, I'll shoot you a, a link once this is done. If you can share that, that'd be great. Um, I can add the match um, links that you have for your profile, but if there's anything else, just shoot me to uh, like via email or something. And I'll include and, that in your episode. Uh, all the all the links on match are good enough. I was looking at I was looking at them. You said the messages. I'm like, yeah, they're all they're basically all on there. And if they, they want to find me something else, they can find me through those. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Well, hey, you have yourself a great day again. Thanks for your time. And um, yeah, shoot You're me a list, and um, that'd be fun. Yeah, I'll show I'll show over to list you in a little bit. All right. Sounds great. Have a great day. All right. You too, man. This has been Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany. Exploring deep stories from real-life guests with real-life experiences. Providing insight to our listeners with every story. 
Stay up to date on future podcasts by bookmarking Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany.podbean.com. And follow Bo on social media by searching Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany. Have an idea for a future story? Send your idea to acrmadison at gmail.com. Until next time, grab life by the horns and keep inspiring others. Thank you.